You're worthy. You're worthy. It's your time to worship. It's your time to worship. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. What's that? What's that part? The ordinary. Just won't do. I need love that's pure and true. I can always find it in you, Jesus. The ordinary just won't do. I need a love that's pure and true. I can always find it in you, Jesus. Come on, come on. The ordinary just won't do. I need a love that's pure and true. I can always find it in you, Jesus. The ordinary just won't do. I need a love that's pure and true. I can always find it in you, Jesus. I belong to you. Type that in below. Say, I belong to you. Type that in. Say, I belong to you. Come on. All the saints. Get those fingers to work. Make that declaration right now across the internet. Say, I belong to you. I belong to you. I belong to you. Ordinary just won't do. I need love, it's pure and true. I can always find it in you, Jesus. The ordinary just won't do. I need love, it's pure and true. I can always find it in you, Jesus. No to you. I belong. Yeah, 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 to you. Father, we thank you <laughs> that we can declare right now, Father, that you are King Jesus in our lives. You are our Lord. You are our Savior, Father. You are our covering. You are our all in all. Everything that we need, Father, you are. And since we belong to you, Father, we lack no thing. We lack nothing, Father. I thank you, Father, that you have supplied all things. You are our supply, Father. You are our overflow, Father. You are our guide, Father. You are our wisdom, God. You are our knowledge, Father. You are our power, Father. Everything that we have, our health, our being, our mindset, God, our, our vision, our eyesight, Father, all of it belongs to you, Father. We give it back to you today. Because we can't take credit for anything. We can't take credit for being born. We can't take credit for the next breath that we breathe. We can't take credit for the next thing that we see. We can't take credit for the next thing that we hear. We can't take credit for the next thing that we feel. Father, you are everything, God, and we give it all in our minds and our hearts. We say it's yours, Father. And Father, I'm asking God that we can transform our hearts in this moment God because we know that there's a there's a spiritual battle God there's a battle that says it's yours and there's a battle that says it's mine God but I'm praying that today Father that we can relinquish give up surrender say Father I I'm ordinary and ordinary just won't do ordinary just won't do father I don't want to be an ordinary peoples I don't want to be an ordinary man I don't want to live an ordinary life I don't want to have an ordinary family I don't want to have an ordinary job father I want an extraordinary everything God and I know that anytime you are leading us father you have taken us beyond and so father I lay down mediocre today father I lay it down right now God I die to myself so that you may live upright inside of me, Father. I humble myself. God, you don't have to humble me, Father. You don't have to take me through the pit of hell. You don't have to strike me down. You don't have to put me in prison. I don't have to be in the emergency room, Father. I surrender myself right now, Father, because I know my plan is not good enough. I know that my thoughts and my mind and my ways are not your ways, Father. But I'm praying now that as I surrender my life to you, that you can get the glory, that you get the glory out of my story, 
that you get the glory out of my testimony, that you get the glory out of my struggles, that you get the glory out of my pain, that you get the glory out of the sunshine, that you get the glory out of the rain, that you get the glory out of my addiction, Father, that you get the glory out of my strongholds, that you get the glory out of my poverty, that you get the glory out of my riches, that you get the poverty out of everything that I do. I do it as I'm doing it unto the Father. Not serving human masters, not serving human girlfriends, not serving human boyfriends, not serving human bosses, Father, not serving human kids, Father, not serving human uh, chains and shackles, Father, not serving human addictions, Father. I don't want to serve any of that. I just want to serve you this morning. Take it. I release it, God. My declaration, type that below. Say, I release. Come on, choir, say, I release. I release. Say it again, say, I release. 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 All to you, Lord. I release all to you, Lord. Oh, I, my strongholds, my pain. Yeah, yeah. I release, I release it all to you, Lord. Full band, full band, full hey, band. I release, I release, I release it all. Oh, I release, I, I release, release, I release it all. I release. I release, I release, I release it all. Whatever it is that you need to release, say it right now. Say, I release, I release, I release, relationship, anger, stronghold, pornography, promiscuous, lying, stealing, cheating, sin, perversion. Anything that's not like you, I release, I release, I release, I release, I release it all. I don't want it. Now. I release, I release, I release, I release it all. Put your hands up, put your hands up, put your hands up, put your hands up. I release, I release, I release it all to you. So I surrender it all to you right now, God. I release, I release all my bills. I release. It all. Everything that's broken in my life right now, oh, Father, I, I release, release, I release, I release, I release, I release, I release, I release it all to you, Lord. Oh, I release, I release it all. Father, we don't just give you lift service this morning. Father, but we put it back in your hand. We put it back in your righteous right hand. We put it back in the hand that you said that you would never leave us nor forsake us. We put it back from where it came from. For as the song we sung as kids, Father, you have the whole world in your hands. And Father, since you have the whole world in your hands, I don't have to worry. I don't have to go back to work this week around people and I don't have to fret, Father. I don't have to fear for my life anymore, God. I don't have to make rash decisions, Father, for my steps are ordered by you, God. I don't have to worry about will you leave me. I don't have to worry about will you take me into danger. I don't have to worry about, God, if, if, you're gonna, if I'm going to die tomorrow. I don't have to worry about if I'm going to be broke tomorrow. I don't have to worry about any of those things, God, because today is the day that you have given me and I pray that today that I can give it all to you, God. Give my thoughts to you, my anxiety. I give it to you, my chemical imbalances, my bipolarism, my schizophrenia. I give it all to you, God, and I know that you can make a perfect work with it, Father. And if you believe that, just go ahead and put some hands up emotion, put some, some clapping hands. If you can just give God a praise that he's not done, that he's not finished with you, and he didn't leave you, but he allowed you to be here this morning. Thank you so much, praise team. Thank you guys so much for leading us into our release. It is our release, release Sunday morning. We are thankful, we are thankful because God is good and he is worthy to be 
praise. I'm so happy that we've gone to this new form of style of, of worship and, and being able to flow right in from the, uh, from the praise and worship into the message. It does wonders for, for, for laying the platforming and allowing us to go into the presence of God this morning. I pray that you feel the spirit through the camera. I pray that you feel it wherever you are, through every screen, uh, through every download, whether you're listening to it in your ears or whether it's, it's projecting out uh, around the world. I'm praying that you feel the spirit because I can feel it right here in this place. And I'm so thankful that God is here. Uh, you're, you're joining in on our YouTube, and I believe this week we have hit 500 um, uh, subscribers. So we praise God for that, that God is expanding the reach, that he's expanding our mission and vision, and he's allowing us to go forth into the places in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all of the ends of the earth. And we're continuing that mission here at Inspiration Church. I, I'm glad to be here this morning. Just say, I'm glad to be here. If you're happy to be on uh, the YouTube stream, say your name. If you're new here, go ahead and put I'm new here. We definitely want to connect with you. We definitely want to love on you and we definitely want to support you because I believe that when the church comes together, there is no lack. When the church comes together, there is no, no need that can't be met. There is no desire that can't be granted. There is no wish that can become a blessing. There is nothing that, that God won't do. There's nothing God that cannot do. There's nothing that God is limited to for we serve an unlimited God in all that we do. Amen. Hey, I have been feasting on this word and I have been eating it. And you may hear some uh, some some parts today that uh, may uh, be made manifest. That may be a little crazy, but I believe that when you eat on the word of God, it should be a dual dimensional. It should feed you your mind. It should it should feed your body. It should feed your soul. It should feed every part of your being. It should feed everything inside of you, because when when God shows up. He changes the game. So, Father, remove any distractions. Father, any distractions that are in the room, Father, I pray that you remove it. Anything that's moving, anything that takes the attention off of the gospel and the word, Father, remove it right now in the name of Jesus. And allow us to be able to focus on you, Father. Every uh, toaster, Father, every oven, God, every cook in the kitchen, God, every child, every footstep, Father, every annoyance, every horn, every siren, every ambulance coming outside, Father. I pray that you protect and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So that the word that goes forward today, it can go through in purity, in goodness, and in grace. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, it's a great time for us to be able to give an offering and sow a seed into uh, God's kingdom. Because when we sow seeds into God's kingdom, it's time for him to birth some things. It's time for him to grow some things. It's time for him to mature some things in your life right now. Whether you're broke, busted, and disgusted, or whether you're rich and fancy, God says at this moment we can give based on the measure that he's given unto us. And so whether your job paid you, unemployment paid you, or whether you're self-employed, no matter what way you have income, the best way to deposit your income and to make sure that it is protected is to sow it into the kingdom of God. And many of you, if this is your first time, uh, we give a tithe and a tithe is 10% of what God has given unto us because God owns it all. He entrusts us with the hundred and he says, give me the 10 and watch when I bless you. Watch I open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that'll be too big for you to receive. And so there are three ways that you can give. You can go to Fellowship One Go. You can go to www.yourinspirationnow.org. Uh, backslash uh, donate and actually it's dot com backslash donate or you can go to dollar sign inspiration church on cash app and be able to give that way either way you give it's going to be a blessing to the ministry and I pray that as you're a blessing to the ministry we can be a blessing to the mission field we can be a blessing to Missouri City uh, to, to Pearland to Stafford and to the air all to the ends of the earth because of what you've been able to do we can't do this without you and so we thank you for our continued supporters we thank you for our first time givers and we thank you for those that are struggling to give, we know that God is going to lead you to a place where you can give and sow and freely give because God loves a cheerful giver. Thank you so much. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you, Lord, for those that have been able to give. I thank you for those that have been able to sow. I thank you, Lord, that you have been able to uh, allow abundance to be able to flow on those in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. Father, we thank you, Lord, that all bills are paid. We thank you, Father, that all needs are met. We thank you, Lord, that the blessings are flowing around us. Father, we thank you, God, that there, if we don't have it, somebody around us has it, and we are never lacking anything. Father, we thank you that you freely give to us if we ask. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 9. We've been talking about Acts. We've been going through Acts one chapter each week. And last week, 
We had a dynamic message, and we talked about Simon the sorcerer. And the week before that, we talked about Stephen, who was stoned. And this week, we talk about an awesome man uh, who, who comes on the scene, and, and he, he, he changes the game forever. And I just want to dissect this particular man for you today because I believe that he is going to, to not only affirm who we are, not only affirm what we are going through, but also affirm your journey and what you have going on uh, going forward. Hey, Acts chapter 9, 1 through 8, I'm going to read it from the New King James Version. And the reason I'm going to do that because in the NIV, it leaves out some portions of this. And I want to make sure that we don't miss the fullness and the greatness of what it has here. It says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, and went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him a bright light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, this is the part that's left out of the NIV. So I want you, I want to read that again. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will Thou have me to do. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him in to Damascus. Here we see this man Saul. Saul is Saul of Tarsus. Saul has grown up in the city called Tarsus. He is uh, a tent maker. His, his uh, family and his tradition and the way that they uh, supplied money for themselves is he would weave the hairs from animals and he would make tents. And, and this man, uh, I guess they had a little, uh, little fortune. They had a little bit of money, Pastor Jordan. And so this guy named Saul, he goes to Pharisee school. And his teacher, Malcolm, is named Gamaliel. And he has this teacher and he, he sits under this man and he learns and he trains and he grains uh, growth inside of this religious sphere. He's a very religious guy. He, he, his goal is to please God. His goal is to love God. His goal is to uh, protect the Mosaic law. He's very learned. He's very educated. He is one of the guys that uh, uh, as he gained notoriety and notability amongst the religious crew, they honored him, they favored him, and they respected this man named Saul. Saul was from Tarsus. Now Saul, as he got older, he moved to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, we know that's where Jesus did many of his works. We know that that's where his power uh, was led. We know that that's where he was killed. We know that that's where he was resurrected. And we knew that the mission and the ministry was supposed to start in Jerusalem and go off from there. Now, at some point, and I don't, I don't know this, and I'm, I'm asking you the question because I don't know from what point did Saul growing up being a leader in the way, being a leader and uh, a mover and a shaker for the Mosaic law, being uh, studied under Gamaliel, uh, training as a Pharisee, did he get to the point where he is now being the leader of the tribe that's persecuting the Christians? And I wrestle with this because how can a man after God's own heart persecute God? How can a man thinking that he's doing the right thing be very anti the thing that he's serving? We know that not in the immediate United States, but we know that there are places around the country where Christians are persecuted. And we know that in the midst of, of persecution, there is uh, uh, many things that, that happen uh, that, that cause um, Christians to have to, to serve God on the underground. Uh, they, they, they call this, this area of the region of the world 10-4. And this is the area where it's, it, it contains China, it contains Asia, it contains these areas, Indonesia, India, where Christianity is not allowed, and they call it the 10-4. And in this particular region, we know that Christians are still getting their heads cut off and things are being experienced that way. And sometimes when we talk about Christians being persecuted in America, we don't understand what that really means. So I want to to reckon it to you like this. Saul would have been the head of the KKK movement. And the reason I say that, because the Ku Klux Klan was a religious organization. 
And they, they served God. They were good old Bible toting, good old preachers, good old folks that, that, that loved the Lord. But they tried to eradicate a, a, a group of people. And so here Saul is now the latest living like the 60s version of the KKK. He is, is, is the head of ICE. Any Hispanics know that when ICE shows up, he's coming to take people and move them out of their homes and take them in to prison. And I'm, I'm starting to think about this. I'm like, man, what if somebody came to my house and said, hey, our, our, we're doing a survey in the neighborhood and uh, we wanted to know what your religious beliefs are. And I said that I'm a Christian. And they looked inside of my house and they took me from my house and took me to prison. How would, how would your wife feel? How would your, 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 your kids feel? How would your, your father feel if, my, if, if some of my daughter was in college and she was the one to open the door and nobody was home? And, they, and she said, Pastor Jordan, I'm a Christian, and they took my daughter off. And the, the part that I'm really, really struggling with is how can this man do this legally? Like, how can this be done legally for a person to come in and exude hate for such a group that he takes them to prison and also taunts them with fear that they may be stoned to death? because of what they believe. Can you imagine your children being ripped from your homes, not because they stole something, not because they shot somebody, but because they're professing to be a Christian. This is what's happening. But then the other thing that baffles me is that if Paul or Saul is snatching these people out of their homes, where is the Christian church? Like, in a few chapters ago that we read, we, we read that when, when Peter, uh, when God got Peter out of, out of jail, out of prison, and he goes back into Solomon's colonnade and he's preaching, it says when they showed up, they didn't even arrest him because they didn't want the, the crowd to, to go bananas. And so I'm wondering at what point, where is, is Peter? Peter's supposed to be the guy that's cutting people's ears off. Peter's supposed to be the one that's protecting his crew. Where is Peter when all of this stuff is happening? People are being stripped from their homes, being persecuted, being put in prison, some being killed. Where is Peter? We are the religious leaders. Where are the people that are supposed to, to protect? I, in my mind, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, if, if I'm, I'm the leader of this organization, we're going to follow a small militia, right? And, and if Saul comes over here, it's going to be the last time Saul goes anywhere. And, and in my mind, that's what I'm thinking. But I can remember when, when, when uh, Peter was in prison, the, the believers, they weren't trying to get him out of prison. They were in their homes praying. And that's cool and all, but I, you know, I have an issue with people being persecuted and people praying while being persecuted. And that could just be the alpha male in you, me, or the fighter in me. But if you persecute me, it's going to be a fight. But they're, they're practicing this version of godliness and Christianity to the T. And so I see in this moment that Saul has been empowered to eliminate people. I want you to think about that. A group has been empowered to eliminate people. That's what they did to the Jews. Hitler was empowered to eliminate a people. That's what happened with the Ku Klux Klan. The Grand Master, he was empowered to eliminate a people. And as Christians, if we're not careful, we can fall very victim to the place where we are empowered to eliminate of people where we talk bad about anybody that, that's not like us and, we, and we, we talk bad about people and we persecute people and we eliminate people and we exclude people all because we've been empowered. We have to watch where our power comes from. And it baffles me how, how we can empower and how we can champion people that are doing things to hurt other people. What was the church doing? I believe and I would hope that that in the moments that these people were being persecuted, that a Black Lives Matter movement rose up. And people begin to, to, to collaborate and say enough is enough. But that's not what happens. Matter of fact, when Paul, Saul comes on the scene, the Christians start to scatter. And uh, Saul has now taken on this new found job. And he goes out and he gets orders and he says, you know what, I'm about to head to Damascus. And he goes to the high priest. And he says, high priest, I need papers so that I can go to Damascus and find anybody that's confessing to be Christ-like. I'm taking them out. Shooters, snipers. He's got boys with him. 
And they get the papers and they're on their way to Damascus. You can't tell Saul nothing. Peter can't tell Saul nothing. John can't tell Saul nothing. Nobody that is a part of this Christian realm can tell Saul anything. Why? Because Saul is the man. Saul is riding that donkey, going to Damascus, which is about 160 miles. If you're from Houston, that's like going to Louisiana or going to, uh, I believe, like Austin or something like that. He gets up with his guys, and they're walking, and they're going, and immediately a big flash of light comes around Saul. Now, this is where the story gets interesting for me in my sanctified imagination, and many of the things that I'm about to say right now are not necessarily biblical, but it's just how I would think that things are happening. Saul... Can't be told nothing by anybody. And I can see Jesus being upset because when he comes on the scene, he says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he knocks Saul off of his donkey. And I'm imagining like this. I know it's football season, but it's not football season. But it is football season. But I'm imagining that Jesus was tired of Saul doing what he was doing to him. And I can imagine Jesus in heaven saying, God, I got to put a stop to Saul because he's not listening to nobody. He's out here doing stuff against me. I need to go get him. And I can think that Stephen overheard Jesus talking to God. And and Stephen was like, what you want to do? You want to go get Saul? I'm coming with you. And and Jesus was telling uh, 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 Stephen, hey, don't worry about that. This is my fight. And Stephen was like, no, they just stoned me a chapter ago. I'm coming with you. And so they have this conversation between Jesus and Stephen. And Jesus leaves, and he comes straight down and knocks Saul off the horse. Boom! You see this video clip? I'm going to play a video clip right now. Check this video clip up. This is just your football fix uh, uh, for, for the fall. Jesus knocks This hard head, hard body, headstrong man named Saul off of his donkey. So much to the point where he looks up, but he's blind. He can't see anybody ever played football or played a sport when you've been knocked out and you saw that light. And you laid there and you was like, dang, that hurt. I've been concussed. I've been knocked out before. I, I felt that. And I feel like that's what Jesus did to Saul because the Bible says that vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. So I'm thinking that Jesus came down and was like, boom, you're not doing this no more. It's over. It's wrapped. It's curtains. So much to the point where Saul looks up and he was like, who, who, who that? Who that? And Jesus says, it's me, Jesus, the one who you're persecuting. And Saul is like, huh? But at this moment, now this is, this is crucial, and I want you guys to, to really think about this. At this moment, this encounter that Jesus has with Saul is not one that's patty cake. This is a hardcore experience because hardcore people need hardcore experiences. And some people won't listen to people. Some people can only listen to Jesus himself. And those people, when Jesus comes down, he's not playing with you anymore. And when Jesus comes down, he knocks Saul off of this donkey and he's laid out at that moment. He says, you know what? You were serving papers from the high priest. Now you're going to be my slave. Saul does not have a choice anymore of who he's going to serve. The choices are off off the table. Everything's off the window. And Jesus is telling Saul, Saul, you are going to follow me. And guess what? Saul is like, okay, tell me what I'm supposed to do. How is it that you can preach to a person all day? You can have Bible study with a person all day. You can send a person text messages. You can call a person. You can do that all day. And what you're doing is you're planting seeds. But until Jesus shows up, transformation does not happen until Jesus says, you know what? All that foolishness that you had going on, boom, I'm done with it. You're going to serve me the way that you're going to serve me. And so this man who was working for the Jewish uh, high priest, this man that was working for all of these guys, now has this life change on the road to Damascus. Now, this is a spiritual experience because he says he sees Jesus, but the people that are with him, they don't know what's going on. They're like, what in the heck is going on with Saul? They don't see him, but he sees Jesus in the spirit because it's a bright light and And he has this encounter, and this man is now blind. Now for 100 plus miles, he has to walk blind to Damascus. Sounds like walking by faith with me. Because after any experience, when your life is transformed and changed, there's a season where you have to walk by faith. 
And he walks by faith to Damascus, and he has these people with him, and it says that Saul does not eat for three days. He goes on a long journey. He does not eat because Jesus didn't beat him up. He didn't got him into a place, and now his whole formation of theology has to change because now Saul has been stripped of his power from persecuting Christians, and God is repenting and changing his mind. Saul was unstoppable, successful, purposeful, strong. Mighty, but your strength is nothing when Jesus shows up in your life. So Saul was on his way to franchise Damascus with his killings and his persecutions. But Jesus says the buck stops here. Saul sees the light and he falls off. And Saul is in bad shape. He's hurting. He's humbled. And he's hearing. But Jesus speaks to him. Really rough, and he tells them, this is what's about to happen next in your life. This is what Jesus says. He says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. It says the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound, but seeing no one. Sot got up from the ground. And though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. And he was unable to see for three days and did not eat and did not drink. My question was, how did Saul get to the point where he was so upset about what Christ was doing that he now eliminated his job of spreading the gospel or spreading the the news about the Mosaic law to now eliminating Christians? What was it that Gamaliel told him? What was it that he experienced? What was it that drove him and made him so passionate about what he was passionate about? What was it that made you so passionate about what you're passionate about? Who said in you purpose? How can you love God, but yet and still be against God's way? How can you love the law of God and the things of God and the church of God, but still behave in a way that crucifies God, hurts God, embarrasses God? And I believe it's because sometimes we think that we know what we're doing. And sometimes we don't have a clue. Anybody ever been in a situation where you thought you knew what you were doing and then you woke up one day and you was like, dang, I ain't have no idea. I didn't know. And some of you may be in that position right now. You, you say, I thought I knew, I thought I had it, I thought I figured it out, but it seems like God has changed the game on me and now everything that I thought I knew, I don't know anymore. I had to unlearn everything that I've learned. They call that higher learning. And so now you're in a position where the stuff that you used to do, it don't work anymore. And I could imagine that, that Saul probably had these, these moments and these, 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 these times and these thoughts about, about moving forward and doing certain things but couldn't do it because it didn't work anymore. The way that he used to think, it didn't work anymore. The way that he used to act, it didn't work anymore. Everything that he learned about the Mosaic Law, all of that stuff didn't work anymore. And so for seven years... Saul studied and he, he struggled and he had to unlearn what he had learned before to come back to now love the thing that he once hated. He had to move from intolerance to a Jesus that is now celebrated. He had to move from breathing thoughts of, of death and murder to now pushing eternal life. He had to move from putting people in prison to preaching freedom, from hating his baby mama, to loving his family. He had to move from death unto life. Now, I want to ask you this question this morning. Was your transformation that powerful? Or was your story a little less violent? Did you have a road to Damascus experience? Or did your parents or family members pave the way for you to be able to head to straight street right away. See, it doesn't matter the significance or the severity of your life change. The real meaning and the real purpose is did your life really change? Because some of us are on our way to Damascus and we have not looked back 
to know from where we've come from, but we're still heading down that same purpose. That same purpose that we started out with, we're still moving in that same purpose. But you know what I believe? I believe that as long as you are moving in purpose, God will stop you and he will redirect you as long as you're faithful about what you're doing. Are you sincere about what you're living your life for? And if you're living your life insincerely, even if you're sincerely wrong, I believe that God is going to be able to use you. Because Saul was sincere. He was sincere about what he was doing. He didn't think that he was sinning. He didn't think that he was missing the mark. He thought he was doing what was right. But the Bible says what seems right to a man, it'll lead to destruction. But you know what? When Jesus comes on the scene, he says, you know what, Saul? I'm taking you. I am now your Lord. And he doesn't give Saul an option. Now, this is crazy to me because I believe that that Christ always gives us options, right? He's not a God that he's going to say, well, Jordan, I'm going to make you do this. Or Jordan, I'm going to make you do this. But you know what? In this situation, Saul didn't have a choice anymore. He said, Saul, your new name is going to be Paul. You're going to go to Damascus. I'm going to send a man there. He's going to tell you what to do from there, and that's it. And Saul was like, okay. In my mind, I was like, dang, Saul just got punked by Jesus. (laughs) But it's at that moment of him being punked that his life now impacts your life. That his life change now now is, is, is the motivational scriptures that we live for. And I can now understand why Saul or Paul says some of the things that he says in the New Testament. Like uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I know why he said that now. Because when Jesus knocked him off of that, uh, that donkey, he was like, now nah, I want no parts. I don't want no parts. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to do anything that's going to put me in a position where I got to feel that bef- again. And some of y'all need to be knocked off of your donkeys harder. Because if you was knocked off harder, you wouldn't keep vacillating and going back into the things that you, that you, God, I pray that you knock us off of our donkeys. And what I'm really praying is that God can humble you in your heart to now wake up and rise up and do what you've been gifted to do. Because here's the real deal. Saul was already moving in purpose on purpose. When he was moving out there, he was saying, I'm not going, to allow to, uh, not going to allow these people to go against the Mosaic law. I'm not going to allow these people to discredit and disintegrate what my forefathers have built up. He would say, I'm not going to allow this to happen. But when his mindset changed, he said, you know what? I'm not going to allow these people to kill my Savior. I'm not going to allow these people to destroy the witness of Christ. I'm not going to allow these people to stand into the greatest miracle that has happened in this world. I am not going to allow it. Because when you have strong men and you have strong beliefs, you you then have a strong community. And so I don't know where Peter was when, when Saul was persecuting, but I'm so glad that Saul switched sides. And I'm thankful that when Saul moved to Paul, he still had that same aggression. To live is Christ and to die is gain. He's not playing games. Even to the point where he says, put me in prison. I'm content whether I have a little or whether I have a lot, whether I'm in chains or whether I'm free. I have learned what it means. But the only way that he understood that is because he went through intense suffering so much to the point when when Jesus told Ananias, he said, Ananias, I want you to go and get Peter, uh, go and get uh, Paul. And he was like, go get who? He was like, go get Saul. He was like, go get who? He was like, go get the guy that was persecuting Ananias. He's like, "Um, why do you want to send me to do that? Because to me, it doesn't make sense for me to go put myself in harm's way. And God is telling Ananias, Don't worry about that. I want you to go lay hands on his eyes. Give him his sight back. He's not the same person that he used to be. And when Saul sees Ananias for the first time when the scales are removed from his eyes, God told Ananias, he says, I'm going to show Saul, Paul, what suffering really is about. Now, that's interesting because I'm not signing up to suffer. Did you sign up to suffer? Did you sign up to suffer? Did you sign up for suffering? I, I didn't sign up for suffering. But Jesus is, is telling uh, Ananias, I'm going to show Saul what suffering really is. If he want to persecute me, he want to beat me up, he want to put my people in prison, I'm going to show him what suffering is all about. But guess what? I'm glad that Saul suffered. I'm glad that Paul suffered because when he suffered, out of that suffering come great jewels. Out of that suffering, we, we understand when, when, when Peter, when Paul says, God has overlooked the times of such ignorance, yet now he is telling mankind that they should all everywhere repent because he has set a day in which he purposes to judge the inhabited earth 
in righteousness by man whom has been appointed and he has furnished and guaranteed to all men and that he has resurrected him from the dead. It's in those moments, he said, for a moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Let her, it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If we go look at Rose, if we go look at Romans and we go look at all of the things that Peter that Paul has talked about, we see that it's strong, we see that it's a promise, but we also see that it comes from a place of great pain. Shipwreck. But you know what he said? I'm still standing. He said, I was persecuted, pressed, but not crushed. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He says, I have the mind of Christ. Even in the book of Romans, he, he, he tells them and he says, Offer your body as a living sacrifice. See, at that point, he's not, he's not talking. He's not talking from Paul's point of view. At that point, the Holy Spirit had arrested Saul, and his whole platitude, lifestyle, had to change. I'm talking to people today that you may be struggling with the life change. You're struggling with accepting that you really have a purpose that's predicated on God. Yeah, you got a strong personality. Yeah, you got you headstrong. Yeah, you got a lot going on. But, but, but what I, what I want to tell you today is that, that strong personalities and strong people need strong leadership. And strong people with strong personalities that need strong leadership cannot be in a place that's passive, that placates for sin. Psalms 32, 8 says it this way. He says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. He says, I am going to teach you the way to go. Hebrews 4, 12 says it this way. He says, for the word of the Lord is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. He's saying that I am going to show you something that you've never seen before, but you have to be willing to lay down your thoughts, be willing to lay down your purposes, be willing to lay down your presuppositions, lady. Be willing to lay down everything that you've had and go blind for Jesus. Type that down below. Go blind for Jesus. Because when you go blind, you're saying that I'm not going to walk by what I see. I'm not going to, to, to take this, this, this walk for life by, by what I hear. I'm not going to, to take this walk by, by what my precepts or by what, what I thought I saw. I am going to go blind for Jesus. Because at that moment that, that Saul is hit with that, that, that lightning and that, that, uh, that punch that Jesus came down with, he says, I'm going blind for Jesus and I don't have a choice anymore. I, I, I love this song. It says, I have no other choice but to trust him. Can you surrender yourself, just like the song says, I belong to you? Can you put yourself in a position where you say, I'm not going to choose any other choice? I'm going to eliminate going backwards. I'm going to eliminate going any other way. I'm going to eliminate going backwards. All I'm going to do is keep pressing going toward the mark. I'm going to continue to move forward. I'm not going to worry about what's behind me, but I'm going to press on to what's in front of me. I'm not going back. Going back is no longer an option. Because until we eliminate the option of going back, we'll vacillate like a ship going to and fro. And it's time for us to stop vacillating. It's time for us to stop going backwards. It's time for us to stop rocking by bang. Only babies get rocked. And the enemy wants to rock you to sleep. And if he can rock you to sleep long enough... Just like he's rocked the church to sleep long enough. If he can get you to be sleep long enough, he won't have to persecute you anymore. He'll let you do that to yourself. How many people are, are self-persecutors? Yeah, you're, you're, you're self-sabotagers. The enemy has set up a playing field. For you to run in circles. But I I see some people today that are coming out of that circle. I see some people that are saying that I'm stepping out of this, 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 this place of persecution. I'm stepping out of this trouble. I'm stepping out of this lifestyle. I'm stepping into the promise of God. I am a child of God. I am 
healed. I am bold. I am a man of God. I am one that lives by faith. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he replied. Get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, the house of Judas, and ask for a man named Tarsus named Saul. Since he is praying there in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord answered, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the Israelites. He says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias went and entered the house, placed his hands on him and said, My brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul's power was extraordinary, and his purpose was greater than what he was doing before. Before, he was doing petty crimes, pulling people and putting them in prison. But the Lord said to him, he said, this is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, to kings, and to the Israelites. The Gentiles are the unclean people, are the people that are outside of the group of people that he would normally go to. Kings, because the scripture says that our gift would make room for us, and it said that we would place, be placed before kings. Israelites, because there was a group of people that he was supposed to go out and speak to and to save and, and to be able to, uh, 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 be able to illustrate the gospel to. So he goes to a people that are broken and are forgotten about. He goes to people that are in high places, and he goes to common people. He goes to all of these places and people because he was chosen an instrument. He was the chosen person. He was the chosen vestible, uh, vessel. He was the chosen thing to go out and be able to explicate the word of God. So this is my question to you. Do you know what you're a chosen instrument to do? Could it be that you have limited your power and your purpose based on your perspective? Maybe you thought that you just could continue on living an ordinary life. But just like the song said, just like the song said, it says extraordinary, ordinary can't be. Ordinary won't be. Ordinary is not the life that I want to live. I want somebody that feels that in their spirit right now to type that below and make the declaration. Ordinary is not my testimony. Ordinary is not my testimony. My life is not to be ordinary. And I don't care if I have been ordinary for 30 something years. It doesn't matter because God is writing my story. And all it does is takes for that one year for your life to go from ordinary to extraordinary. All it takes is that one encounter from, uh, with Jesus Christ on the way to Straight Street. It's all it takes is that one moment, that one time, that one year, that one 10 year experience that will now explode you into your destiny. Don't give up on the ordinary that you're facing right now because God has some extraordinary things for you right now. And I believe that the extraordinary is the time and the place where God is trying to elevate you, he's trying to escalate you, and he's trying to take you into a posture and a place that generations from now will be able to believe and understand that your testimony is powerful. That is greater than the pain that you're in right now. It's greater than the suffering that you're feeling right now. I know you feel like you can't get out. I know you feel like you're stuck. I know you feel like you're in a circle. I know you feel like there's no way out. I know you feel like the world is against you. I know you feel like there's, there's something that's holding you back. But God is saying, I'm giving you freedom right now. All you have to do is come and learn of me. Sup with me. 
Get in your word and read and learn of me. He says, because when you, you learn of me, I'm going to lead you to the people that you're supposed to go to. Yeah, you're supposed to be sitting in front of presidents. Yes, you're supposed to be sitting in front of CEOs, not passing out a pamphlet. It may be you doing business, doing your, your regular thing that you're passionate about. But he says, I'm going to take you. If you do with excellence, I'm going to take you before kings. So yeah, you don't have a job, but I believe that God is going to make you meet a principal and you'll be hired on the spot. And you're not just hired on the spot just to make money. You're hired on the spot so that you can give a transformational word. I believe right now that contractors and, and people that are bidders and, and uh, uh, folks that are coming out that, that can open up gates and doors for you, they're not going to open that door for you just because of your giftedness, but they're going to open it because you're anointed. And God is saying, I'm sending you into that place because I'm placing you before kings right now. Saul goes before the, emperor, uh, the empire. He goes before Caesar. He goes to these places, but he goes through prison. And I know some of you saying that I keep going through prison in relationships, prison in jobs, prison in mentality, prison in places, prison in personality. He says all of those things that you've gone through where you feel like you've been locked up, I'm going to take you to the place where you need to go. Elevation is your story. Type that down below. Elevation is my story. And it's not because of how much money I want to gain. It's because God will just claim to fame to be over your life. God is reshaping you. God is remolding you. God is changing your name today. Some of you need to have a name change. They called you whore, they called you prostitute, they called you little, they called you Joe Smo, they called you Joe Blow, but that's not who God called you. Saul was living under a false pretense for most of his life, but when he had an encounter with Christ, he changed the game. They called you whole, but God calls you holy. They called you pitiful, but God calls you pious. They call you broke, but God calls you blessed. They call you chaos, but God calls you Christian. They said you were a hater, but God is saying you are holy. You are a chosen priesthood. You are a, a royal priesthood. You have been selected. You've been handpicked. I chose you. I came and got you out of the muck and the mire. I got you out of the dirt. I got you out of the streets. I got you out of the clubs. I got you out of your stupor. I got you out of your addiction. And I'm cleaning you off because I want to show the world what I can do with something that's so dirty. Your dirt. <laughs> you know, the... the the private stuff, your dirt is the thing that's going to give you a drastic change. Yeah, I struggle. When I was single, I struggled with women. When I was married, I struggled with pornography. When I was pastoring, I struggled with gambling. But all of those things is going to lead me to be able to, to connect and reach the people that are in front of me. My next book that I'm working on is going to be called The Gambler's Prison. Because there were many a times that I was free, but my line, mind was locked up. And the worst thing about being in sin, this, this is the worst thing, is that you know you're doing something wrong, but it's like you stay in it. You know it's wrong, but you're so enslaved that it doesn't matter that you can be telling yourself, I'm stupid, don't sleep with this person. Carlos, you know that's dumb or, or, or whatever. I, I know I shouldn't be here. I know I shouldn't be running in this person's house. So I know I don't need to pick up this phone call, but you're enslaved to sin. And I know, I know that 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 I shouldn't be here, but I'm stuck because I'm in prison. But just like I am a child of Paul was in prison, it was in prison that he wrote most of the word. And so the next time that you feel yourself in that prison, it's time for you to start writing the feelings and the thoughts and the experiences that you have, because that's what, that's what Paul does. He writes and he pens not only promises, but he pens progress for humanity. Some of you in your prisons right now, 
God won't release you until you allow the pen to leak the promises that he's telling you right now. Until you can understand, until you can grab and hold on to, until you can be able to speak power in the midst of pitifulness, you'll never understand what it means to say to live is Christ and to die is gain. I believe that you can overcome this season. And it's not because I'm a hope preacher. It's not because I'm a faith preacher. It's because the Bible says that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. There may be somebody that's on this, on this video today. You feel like you can't get out. You feel like you can't overcome. You feel like life has passed you by. Or you may feel like you're bold. You might feel like you're on the right path, but you might be rightfully wrong. No matter where it is, Jesus is going to come to you just the way he needs to. You're a hard head, don't worry. Jesus got something for that. You're soft-hearted and unsure. God has something for that because his love, although it's unconditional, it comes in all forms. If you're a strong person, Jesus got something for that. But I pray that you get into a place, get into a posture, get into a presence that works for you so that you don't be stuck in a prison, not getting to the place of your palace. God, I thank you for these people. I pray that you release them, that you take them to the place that you would have them to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, glory to God. Thank you, Pastor Carlos, for that amazing message. Right now I have three appeals for you, three invitations. The first invitation is for salvation. Now you heard Pastor Carlos speak about Apostle Paul on his donkey and Christ knocking him off. Maybe right now you're on your donkey and maybe right now you need salvation. Right now, if the Holy Spirit is tugging up on your heart and you know that you're a sinner and you admit that you're a sinner, you know there's no way to heaven but through the Son. No way to the Father but through Christ. And you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now is the perfect moment. All you have to do is admit that you're a sinner, believe that God sent His Son down the cross for you, and then confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Here's my second invitation. Maybe you were like Apostle, uh, uh, maybe you were like Saul before his name was changed to Paul, and maybe you thought that you were doing right. Maybe you were doing rightfully wrong. Maybe in your faith walk, there are some areas that you can tighten up and rededicate and focus on. Right now, this invitation is for rededication. Rededication states that I understand that I'm a Christian, I understand that I'm saved, but maybe my life doesn't quite add up or look like what it should and you want to make those necessary adjustments right now is the greatest time to be able to do that if that's you just type connect right under the submission bar right now and we'll connect with you in that manner and then my third appeal is for church membership we want you to be connected not just to watch sermons on Sundays or to watch Bible study on Wednesdays but we want you to be connected with us in your journey and in your walk of faith and how could you do that unless you're connected to a church? If you don't have a church that you're connected to, Inspiration Church is a great church. Our motto and our mission is to love, live, and lead. And so if you feel like you've been blessed by the messages and you want to be connected to a church who empowers the community and empowers its people, right now just type connect and someone will answer you. We have people who are alive right now who are able to assist you in that manner. Hey, listen. Whatever invitation you chose, I want to tell you that you chose the right invitation. Because any invitation that comes from God is good. Hey, listen, I love you. I do pray you're blessed. And always remember, as you go through your life, to love, live, and lead. That was an amazing word by Pastor Carlos. Yes, it was. We want you to stay connected. Ways to stay connected are our social media and website. Yes, stay connected through our social media and our website. Again, www.yourinspirationnow.com. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, also on Instagram. 
So continue to follow us. Now, one of the things I really, really miss or I have been missing here lately has been you. Yeah, you, Khalees. I miss you, Khalees. Can we give a social distance hug right now? Sweet. We miss each other. Do y'all miss each other? If you miss each other right now, give each other a hug right now. Come on, get a hug. Mm, we miss you. What do you miss most about youth church and at being at church on Sundays? Well, what I miss most about being at church is just connecting with people more in person, you know, face to face. Yeah, yeah I, I really miss connecting face to face and actually seeing our youth and seeing everyone in ministry on Sundays. Uh, really, 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 really miss y'all. So as Pastor Carlos said last week, we can't wait to get started and get reconnected again. Now, I know currently you have started going back to school. How has that been? It's been okay. It's not the best, but it's not the worst. So are you ready to go back to school or do you kind of like chilling from home? I'm ready to go back to school. What? Now, all this time, these kids did not want to go back to school. All of a sudden, you take it away from them for about five months and they're ready to go back to school. That's a message. Extend our summers to six months. What do you think? No. Okay, never mind. That's a fail. Well, what do you uh, enjoy about being at home right now? Not having to wake up as early. Ah, there's a perk. And what else? How about um, the food? Is the food at home better or is it food better in the cafeteria. The food at home. Woo, she better stay at home because I know her mama and look, you you better like that that home food. So Khalees, do you miss your friends? I do. You do. How do you guys stay connected? Messages and FaceTime. Messages and FaceTime? Now I'm old. I don't do TikTok, so do you guys communicate through TikTok? No. So what's the purpose of a TikTok? So you can post your videos and get likes and follows. Oh, what do you do on your TikTok? Dances. What kind of dances do you do on your TikTok? All kinds of dances. I'm trying to get her to do a dance. She's not She's not going to do it. Come on, Khalees. Okay, no TikTok. But um, we, you stay connected through FaceTime and videos. So uh, that leads us to transition into uh, a way that you can stay connected with us. So this Sunday, our kids, or today, our kids are going to be doing a Zoom call. That'll be at 1130 if you have not received a message for zoom there's a number that flashes across your screen right now you can text us and we can try to send you that zoom call information in addition to that we'd also uh, invite you to stay connected through one of the things we talked about earlier and that's through our i groups Khalees, are you a part of an i group no that face says no so if you have that face right now you should be connected to one of our I groups. We have an amazing testimony uh, that we shared earlier, but I'd love to share it again. It is from one of our beautiful ministers, Alicia. Hi everyone, my name is Alicia Brown and this is Coco Brown and we are members at Inspiration Church. I tried my best to record this video without her, but she wouldn't let mommy do it, so she's joining me here today. Yeah. And what we're doing today is we're going to be describing the I groups that I'm part of. The two I groups that I belong to are Yo Pros and Between the Sheets, the Book Club. Yo Pros, we meet every other Thursday and we talk about everything that a Yo Pro or young professional goes through in our daily lives. And then in the uh, Between the Sheets Book Club, uh, we go through fun books like this, Anxious by Nothing by Max Licato, and it just goes through um, ways that we can find calm in a chaotic world. I love being a part of the iGroups at Inspiration Church because I'm free to be me, and it's just a way to share with others and just know that we are not alone and there's no reason to feel alone, especially in a church like ours in um, I groups because we check on each other. We're there for each other, you know, good times and bad times. And we can be free to share in ways um, 
that we are not feel we don't have to feel judged and everything that's said within our group stays in our groups. Um, so there's that level of trust there. I love our iGroups. Go to your inspiration now forward slash iGroups so that you can find one that suits you best. And I hope to see you soon. Love you guys. That was an amazing testimony. Thank you, Alicia, for sharing that with us. This morning, we want to take the time to pray for our administrators, our teachers, our school board, everyone, the janitors, the hall monitors, everyone that's going back to school. Um, and do you have any special prayer requests going back to school? Um, I just hope that everyone stays safe during this difficult time. That's, a, that's an awesome prayer. So let's go ahead and bow our heads, close our eyes, and go into prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day. Your word says that this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice in it, Father God, because we have life and we have it more abundantly through you, Father God. We thank you for your sacrifice, Father God, that gives us life. Father, as we go into the school year, many of us have already started the school year. Uh, we pray over our educators. We pray over our uh, students. We pray over the staff, Father, that they will remain safe, Father, that they will continue to learn, that they'll continue to grow, that those who struggle with uh, putting their kids back into school, Father God, that you give them clarity of thought. For those teachers that are struggling with deciding on whether to go back to school, Father, that you give them guidance, Father God, and a sound mind, Father. Uh, for those teachers that decide not to go and there may be a loss of income, Father God, we just uh, pray over their financial situation, Father God, that they be good stewards, Father God, and, and they find other avenues uh, to be able to make ends meet, Father. We pray over this, uh, the staff that goes into the school, Father. We pray over their, their safety, their well-being, Father God, their health, Father. We pray over the administrators that are making decisions uh, over uh, everyone, Father God. We just uh, ask for your hand and for your anointing, for your blessing uh, to be upon everyone, Father. We just thank you for everything that you've done, all the blessings that are happening right now that we do not see, Father God, all the blessings that are happening that we don't have room enough to receive, but we do receive them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you guys for joining us for another amazing Sunday service. And don't forget to love, live, and lead. lead.